Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. John Lund in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents a story from your morning newspaper, the dramatic expose of narcotics peddling among teenagers, as reported in Melody in Dreams. Our star, Mr. John Lund. Well, Harlow, 1952 was a pretty good year. Pretty good? Why, Hap, they just don't come any better than complete electrical systems designed and built by Autolite for manufacturers of many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. All units, including the generator, starting motor, distributor, and coil, spark plugs, and batteries are engineered to give the finest performance money can buy. My car is Autolite equipped, Carlo. Millions are, half, because Autolite electrical systems have been used as original equipment ever since 1911, when Autolite developed the first six-volt, two-unit electrical system for the industry. That means Autolite electrical systems have been starting, lighting, and providing electrical energy for car owners for 41 years. That is a record, Harlow. Yes, so friends insist on Autolite original service parts for your Autolite-equipped car. Because only Autolite original service parts are related by Autolite engineering design to fit and work as a team with your car's electrical system. You'll find it pays because from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents transcribed... Melody in Dreams, starring Mr. John Lund, a dramatic report based on fact, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Hi, Lieutenant. Where's Shank? Uh, He's in the other office on the telephone. Thanks. All right, Mr. Graff. Yes, sir. I have the address. We'll try to get out there as soon as we can. Keep the girl there. Yes, sir. Oh, hi, Chris. How was it, Lou? Might be the lead. Huh. Fat chance. There was a guy named Graff, Walter Graff. He lives out on South Tyburn. He found a cache of marijuana cigarettes hidden in an old coffee can in his daughter's bedroom. How old is the girl? All of 16. She nearly went hysterical when the old man confronted her with a can with a cigarette. Yeah, they all do. This kid's thrown convulsion. Huh. Old man must be a funny character. Can you imagine? Made a citizen's arrest of his own daughter. For almost six months, the narcotics division had been trying to find the leak. The hole through which an estimated $70,000 worth of drugs was being passed to high school kids monthly in the forms of marijuana, opium, and heroin. Regular stakeouts, raids, and arrests have been made. The number of teenage addicts arrested was a staggering, frightening total. Arrests made yielded the addicts, but they didn't yield the source of supply. In the meantime, public sentiment and high official pressure, abetted by the newspaper headlines, was growing, while police department investigation was groping. Each and every possible lead obtained had to be followed up. In the case of Walter Graff, who'd made a citizen's arrest of his 16-year-old daughter after discovering marijuana cigarettes hidden in a coffee can in her bedroom, another lead was about to be followed up. This is the address, Chris. Yeah. Huh. Nice old house. Ring the bell. Sure. Well, they don't build them like this anymore. Maybe they don't take the time. <laughs> Agnes goes for this kind of architect. Yes? Police. Mr. Graff? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Come in. I'm Mr. Graff. Thanks. Uh, here. Uh, let's go into the living room. <clears throat> Please be seated. You'll have to excuse the appearance of the house, gentlemen. Ever since Mrs. Graff passed away, I haven't taken much interest in such things as cleanliness. <laughs> I know it's wrong, We but... understand. I presume you're here in response to my telephone call? Yes, sir. I'm Lieutenant Royals. This is Detective Sergeant Shank, narcotics detail. Yes. Yes. I'm quite upset, as you can see. Uh, The shock... uh... You're only one parent among many, Mr. Graff. Oh, I know, I know. I read the newspapers, too. They're full of it. Every day you read about the horrible... When did you discover the coffee can with the cigarettes, Mr. Graff? This morning. Early this morning. 
You see, I didn't go to work today. I wasn't feeling very good, so I stayed home. It's the first time I've ever been absent. Why did you wait until this evening to report the discovery? Why did I wait until this evening? Yeah. Well, because I couldn't believe it. I simply couldn't believe it. Don't you understand? Joan is my child. How is a father supposed to believe such a terrible thing of his child? We understand. I had to give Joni a chance to deny it, Lieutenant. I had to give her a chance to yell to her papa that she knew nothing about the coffee can and its sinful contents. Did she deny knowing about the can? Deny it? She didn't even try to defend herself. She admitted the guilt. But what hurt most of all was her... her arrogance. What are you going to do about it, she said to me. Well, I did the only thing I thought was right to do. I called the police. I'm sorry, Mr. Graff. Oh, don't be sorry, Lieutenant Royals. It, it's a very funny story. And the neighbors will thoroughly enjoy it. Ring around the rosy, old man Graff arrested his daughter. She's a dope fiend, pocket full of posies. What made you suspect the cigarettes contain marijuana, Mr. Graff? Suspect? How do I know? Well, lots of things. Joan's moods, strange moods. Moods which I can't describe to you because I don't know how. Her friends. Friends? One in particular. Uh, Mickey Malone. No good. No good, Lieutenant. I see. Now, where is the can with the cigarettes, Mr. Graff? One moment. Here, Lieutenant Boyle. Here. The poison. Take it. Burn it. Destroy it. The time was 7.30 when Joan Graff was booked in at police headquarters on a charge of illegal possession of narcotics. The file sheet also listed the name of the arresting citizen, Walter Graff, the girl's own father. Joan was a plain-featured girl, bleached blonde hair, fair skin, narrow hazel eyes, and a slim, slight frame. After Detective Sergeant Shank had finished typing the police report, we took the girl back to interrogation for further questioning. Go ahead, Joan. Sit down. Thank you. Tell me, Joan, uh, how old are you? Sixteen. Do you know why you're here? Yes. My father arrested me. That's why I'm here. You've broken a law, Joan. A very serious law. Does everyone get a sermon? This is no sermon. You've been charged with illegal possession of narcotics. That's a very serious charge. I know. I also know I'm a minor. Yes, you are. In which case, you'll be turned over to the juvenile authorities. What'll they do to me? They can do a lot. They have the authority to take you out of school, away from your friends, give you the treatment you need. They can also send you to a detention home, if necessary. What kind of meals do they serve? Well, they don't serve cigarettes like these in detention homes. Where'd you get them? Nowhere. They didn't just happen out of thin air. Where'd you get them? I don't know where I got them. Look, Joan, you've broken the law. You've done something very wrong. But it's not entirely your fault. You're not the real enemy. The real enemy is the person who sold you these cigarettes. And that's the enemy we want. Who was it? Please, I, I... I don't remember where I got them. I... Are you trying to shield somebody, Joan? Is that it? No, it's nobody. I don't know. All right, Joan. All right. You don't have to tell us. I'm not going to force you to do something you don't want to do. That'd be wrong. But there's something I want to explain to you. And I want you to try to understand it. It's about your father and what he did. My father. When he arrested you, he did the only thing he thought was right. I'm his daughter. His own flesh and blood. Yes, his own flesh and blood. That's right. Right. And don't you realize what it must have done to him inside? I don't want to talk about him. Please. I've got two children of my own, Joan. Two small boys. Oh, please. If they were older and either one of them had done something like this, I swear to you I'd do the same thing that your father did. Okay, Lou. That's all for now. Let's go. Lieutenant. Yes? Lieutenant, I'll tell you. I'll tell you where I got the cigarettes. All right, tell me. From Nicky. 
Nicky Malone. My boyfriend from high school. Do you know where Nicky gets them? There's a coffee shop somewhere near our school. That's how Nicky gets the cigarettes, I think. Haven't you ever been to this coffee shop with Nicky? No. I don't even know where it is. I see. Will I uh, put out a call on the Malone kid? No, I don't think that's necessary. We'll go out to the house and talk to him. Lieutenant. Yes, Joan? I understand. Understand what? My father. His hurt inside. I have that same hurt. Joan Graff volunteered the address of her high school boyfriend, Nicky Malone. Detective Sergeant Shank made arrangements for the girl to be turned over to the juvenile authorities pending further investigation. And then we went out to question Nicky Malone. The address the girl had given us turned out to be located in a rundown section of the city. 763 was a white single frame house badly in need of repairs. The shades were drawn, but a dim light inside indicated someone was at home. Want to knock? Uh, sure. Yes? Does uh, Nicky Malone live here? Who wants to know? Police officers. I'm Lieutenant Royals, Sergeant Shank. Oh? What's the boy done? We'd like to ask him some questions. He at home? Yeah, yeah, yes. He's uh, getting ready to go out. Come in, officers. What is it you wanted Nicholas for? We'd like to talk to him. You sure? How about a drink? No, thanks. You? Uh, no. Mind? You any relation to the boy? Relation? Sure. I'm his Uncle Fred. And Nicky. Nicky! Yeah? What do you want? What's the matter? He's a policeman, Nicky. They want to talk to you. Right? That's right. Policeman? What do you want to talk to me about? It's about your sideline at high school. Beats me. What kind of a sideline are you guys talking about? Narcotics. You guys must be crazy. You know what we're talking about. I do. Nicholas, maybe Listen you... to these guys, Unc. Shake them down, Lou. Hey, what is this? Routine, Nicky. Come on, empty your pockets. What? I said empty your pockets. Oh, for the... Come lo- on, come on. Oh. There. That's what I got in my pockets. A jackknife, a handkerchief, some change, and a billfold. Go on, bite the quarter. Maybe you'll get a kick. You're pretty funny, son. Where's your room? You saw me come out the door. Want to take a look, Lou? Yeah. Don't you think you'd uh, better tell me what this is all about, Lieutenant? I am the boy's guardian. We suspect your nephew of passing out marijuana cigarettes to students at his high school. Marijuana cigarettes? (laughs) There must be some mistake, Lieutenant, not Nicholas. Of course not me. That isn't what your girlfriend Joan told us. I get it now. That kid gets caught with a weed and she tries to pass the buck to me. Why, if I ever get my hands on All her... All right, Nicholas, that's enough. Anything, Lou? Cleans the whistle. Okay, Nicky, where is it? Where's what? The cigarettes. Look, I told you once, I'll tell you again. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have no marijuana cigarettes. You found me clean, didn't you? Make me some trouble. That isn't what your girlfriend, Joan Graff, told us. I don't care what she told you. You got no evidence to arrest me. All right, Nicky. That's all for now. Come on, Lou. And we were right back where we started. Up against another frightened high school student who refused to divulge the source of his supply of narcotics. We didn't have any physical evidence on Nicky Malone, but we did believe that the young girl had been telling the truth and therefore decided to place him under surveillance. He was our closest link to the source of the narcotic supply. For four days, we followed his every move. At 8.30 every morning, he left the house, walked six blocks to his high school, left school at 3.20 and walked two blocks to a coffee shop where he had a chocolate milkshake and then returned home. He didn't leave the house at any time during the evenings. On the fifth day, the boy went to the coffee shop, had his regular milkshake, and then played the jukebox. Once again, when he left the coffee shop, we followed him. He's 
heading in the opposite direction, Chris. Yeah. This may be it, Lou. He may be going to pick up some stuff. He's turning the corner on a Madison. Here we go, Lou. Hold your breath. Yeah. Huh. Pretty bright kid, huh, Chris? Yeah. If we're right about him, we've got nothing but trouble. He's disappeared. Autolite is bringing you Mr. John Lund in Melody in Dreams. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Any New Year's resolutions, Harlow? Ah, two mighty important ones to help car owners everywhere, Hap. Oh, how, Harlow? Why, by reminding them that their car's electrical system works like a beaver every second their engine runs, and it provides energy for starting, sounding a horn, lights, heater, radio, electric windshield wiper, and cigarette lighter. Autolite makes complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. Right you are, Hap, and that's why my second resolution is to tell car owners to treat the important electrical system of their car to a periodic checkup for top performance at all times. Good advice, Harlow. Right. So, friends, have your car's electrical system checked by experts. Your nearest authorized Autolite service station has specialized equipment to service all makes of cars. You can quickly locate him in the classified section of your phone book under Automobile Electrical Service or call Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. John Lund in Elliot Lewis's production of Melody in Dreams, a dramatic report well calculated to keep you in suspense. Right out from under our noses. How's it possible? Like I said, Chris, bright boy. Must have known he was being followed. Oh, of course he did. Lots of nerve. The law on his tail, and he still does business. Yeah. Well, he's got to go home sometime. That's right, Lou. He's got to go home sometime. And that's where he's going to find us. We got back in the police car and drove over to the Malone house. Parked across the street and waited. It was beginning to get dark. The shades were still drawn. I wondered if anybody ever bothered to raise them. Time passes slowly when you're waiting. Cigarette, Chris? No, my mouth feels like an oven now. Somebody's home. Probably his polite uncle. Funny guy. Wonder what he does for a living. Oh, I saw a lot of music sheets laying around. Probably in the business. Hey. What? Thought I saw something moving in the driveway. Shadow. Might be the kid. Let's go. It is somebody. Get your flash ready. Okay, hold it. Hey. All right, kid, stand still. Don't move. What is this, cops again? Yeah, Nicky, cops again. I thought I shook you guys once. Why did you shake us, Nicky? Because... Because I don't like being followed. That's your story, son. Where have you been? I haven't been anywhere. Where did you go after you lost us? I went for a walk in the park. What did you do, pick up the stuff? What stuff? All right, Lou, I'll hold the light, shake him. No, what is this? I have it. I got some rights. Come on, Let me along. Come Get on. Your... Easy, son. Easy. Hey. What's this, Nicky, in your coat pocket? Nothing. It ain't nothing. Give me that. Open it up, Lou. Chris? That's an awful lot of nothing, Nicky. Six packs of marijuana cigarettes. booked the boy down at police headquarters on a charge of illegal possession of narcotics. And then we interrogated him. Although he realized the seriousness of the charges, he still refused to tell us where he'd obtained the cigarettes. His guardian uncle was notified and came down to see the boy. He seemed quite concerned. We listened in on their conversation. The uncle pleaded with the boy to tell us all he knew about the narcotics. 
but Uncle's pleas went unheard. A few days later, I decided to bring Nicky Malone and Joan Graff together, face to face. I didn't know what I hoped to learn. Maybe nothing. Maybe something in a moment of temper. On the morning of December 21st, the young boy and girl were brought to my office. Sit right over there, Nicky. Thanks. Well? Wouldn't you like to say hello to Joan? Hello, Nicky. Know any more good stories, policeman? Nicky, I'm so scared. Scared of what? This whole thing. It's so terrible. She's right, Nicky. Something like this can ruin your whole life. Don't you realize that? Well, stop with a sermon, will you? Your uncle seems like a pretty nice guy, Nicky. How did you turn out to be such a bad apple? Is that part of your job, policeman? Telling people what they are? No. No, it's not, Nicky. I'm sorry I said that. Because, basically, I think you're a good boy. I think you're intelligent enough to know what's right and what's wrong. And you know this is wrong. I don't have to reason with you. The thing that really puzzles me is why an intelligent young boy like you refuses to right this wrong. You made a mistake. We all make mistakes. Mistakes are forgivable, Nicky. Nicky, the lieutenant is right. Ah, what do you know anyway, loud mouth? Couldn't keep your mouth shut, could you? You had to tell him. I hurt my father, Nicky. I hurt him very much. I had to tell the police all I knew. Big blabbermouth. Well, find yourself another boyfriend, sister. Nicky. See if he'll get your stick. Yeah. Uh. Another stick, Nicky? I mean... Yeah, I know what you mean. Another stick of this. Oh, why can't you leave me alone? Give me a trial. Send me up. I don't care what you do. Trial? Jail? No, son. They're not the answer. Not really. I'm trying to make you understand that you've got a long life ahead of you. It'll be a shame to ruin it now. Our last chance, then. Stake out the coffee shop. For four days, Detective Shank and myself kept it under surveillance. The evening of December 29th, I walked into the coffee shop to relieve Detective Shank. It was ten minutes to seven. Lou? Hi, Chris. Don't look so sour. Go home and get some sleep. You gonna sit it out? Yeah, a couple hours, maybe. I'll sit around with you for a while. How about a cup of coffee? Yeah, I'm up to here, no thanks. Anything? No, nothing. Just stares from the guy who owns this place. He keeps leering. You want me to stick around and go play a record on the jukebox? Here, here's a dime. The jukebox? Yeah, play something. Let's make it festive around here. The afternoon Nicky got away from us, he broke his pattern. He did something different. Something he'd never done before. He played the jukebox. That's right. He played the jukebox. Billy May. Wish you were here. Broken. Oh. Thanks. Now I'll stay with you for a while. Might even have a cup of coffee. I was right about Nicky's uncle being in the business. What? This is his record. He wrote the tune. He's playing it. Whoa. What do you know? The guy's a celebrity. So that's what he did. Lou... The night we picked up the Malone kid, we thought he was coming home with his stuff, right? Yeah. We couldn't see. It was too dark. But what if it was the other way around? What if the kid was leaving instead of just arriving? Yeah. Yeah. We've come in here for four days straight. That record wasn't on the machine. The day that the kid disappeared, he played the machine. Come on. Let's talk to the guy at the counter. You the owner, mister? Yeah, yeah, I'm the owner. Police officers. Uh, police? Oh, hey, now, what... Don't get excited. Just want to ask you a few questions. Well, sure, sure, officers, anything. There's a new record on that machine by a Freddie Malone. Oh, yeah, him. I know him. Nice guy. Nice guy? Yeah. Every week he comes in, slips me a ten. Slips you a ten? Yeah. Put his record on the machine. 
says even if it does cost him dough, he wants to push it. It's a nice tune, now. Uh, melody and Dreams. <laughs> Back at headquarters, we learned the whereabouts of Uncle Freddy Malone. He was playing piano in a small nightclub on Halstead. The place was crowded with people when we got there. In a corner off to the right was a platform. And on the platform, at the piano, sat Freddy Malone. Think there'll be any trouble, Chris? I doubt it, Lou. He's not the type. Hello, Mr. Malone. Hello, police officers. You have a request... Yeah. Melody and Dreams. One of my favorites. That's no surprise. It was wrong, huh? Real wrong. A lot of poor, innocent kids, Mr. Malone. Real wrong. Poor, innocent kids. We still don't know how the record figured in. That was how Nicky notified the other kids he was ready to pass the stuff. And the night we caught him? He was leaving the house. He was on his way out to make delivery. Poor kid. Try to protect me. Yeah. Someday I'll do something for him. Maybe. Shall we go? The manager won't like it if I don't stick around. It's going to be a big night. Can't stick around, huh? Not tonight, Mr. Malone. Let's go. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. John Lund. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. They are members of the Autolite family, as well as are the 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our family also includes the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and Autolite plants in many foreign countries, as well as the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. In the next two weeks, we will attempt to solve one of the most famous of all literary puzzles as we present Charles Dickens' unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. And it begins next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lut Gluskin. Portions of the program were transcribed. Melody and Dreams was written for suspense by Richard George Pettuccini. In tonight's story, Anne Whitfield was heard as Joan and Sam Edwards as Nicky. Featured in the cast were Shep Mencken, Howard McNear, Joseph Kearns, and Junius Matthews. This is Harlow Wilcox again. When we meet next week, it will also be next year. And so, Autolite and all of us here on Suspense sincerely wish each of you a very happy 1953. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>